It's time to eat. What are you hungry for? Sit down and get ready to consume an abundance of fantasy football knowledge from Ross Tucker and John Daigle. Feed me now! I'm starving! On the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast. Yeah, let's eat, baby. It is the Fantasy Feast Eating Podcast. We are, of course, presented by DraftKings. I'm Ross Tucker, former NFL offensive lineman, five teams, seven years. Most of you know this. Now I get to do a bunch of games on TV, which I love. A boatload of podcasts. Ross Tucker Football Podcast is daily. Weird week because of my travel. So today we had my power rankings. Tomorrow it'll be Greg Cosell. And then Friday I'll give you my picks each and every game. Week six in the NFL. Even Money Podcast, we had a huge week five. Let's hope that continues in week six. Bunch of bets, ATS this week, that I hope a lot of you get a chance to check out. College Draft with Emery is fantastic. And you may notice from time to time, we're putting some of the different shows on the network into different feeds, right? So this show might be on the main feed, the Raw Sucker Football Podcast feed. You know why? Because John Daigle is awesome, and I want as many of you to be exposed to him as possible. Absolutely love the info. I try to only have two or three social media clips from each show, but with John, I write down like five or six. Then I have to go through the self-editing process of which ones we're actually going to post on social and which ones we aren't. Check him out like I do on social media, at NotJDaigle. Or EstablishTheRun.com. It's a fantastic website. A lot of you are already familiar with Adam Levitan. Of course, Evan Silva, if you're a longtime listener. Or someone that watches us. YouTube.com slash Ross Tucker NFL. We never had the video component when it was Evan. That was like, that was BV, before video. Just make sure you use the code FEAST at EstablishTheRun.com. John, we got four teams on buys this week. Vikings, Dolphins, Rams, Chiefs. So we'll start with the Thursday nighter. And it is the Seahawks and the Niners. Really curious to get your thoughts on both these teams in this matchup. A lot of people view the 49ers offense as a unit that is currently struggling. But if you step back, you realize they're still averaging 6.3 yards per play, the second most in the NFL. Where they're really struggling is the red zone. I personally think that's because when the field becomes condensed, Christian McCaffrey is not there to help out in the shallow area and create yards after the catch, despite how much talent they have surrounding Brock Purdy right now. But even this past week against the Cardinals, the Niners had six drives that reached goal-to-go situations, and they scored just one touchdown on those six possessions. It's inexcusable right now. What's also concerning for the 49ers in this game, although I think their offense still gets there as a whole, is that this is the same matchup that stumped Brock Purdy last year against Mike McDonald's Ravens defense. Not apples to apples, since the Seahawks are banged up and clearly involve entirely different players, but Mike McDonald did get Purdy for 255 yards and four picks before he was benched in that game for Sam Darnold. So I I am curious to see what Purdy and Kyle Shanahan do in this particular matchup to answer the Seahawks defense. Around that though we at least saw the recalibration of Brandon Ayuk getting involved on the boundary against the Cardinals. Something we'll talk about whenever we get to the Packers game coming up soon. But the 49ers offense still very condensed without McCaffrey between Debo Ayuk, especially this week where you attack the Cardinals or you attack the Seahawks from the middle of the field in order to avoid those all pro boundary corners and Devin Witherspoon and Tariq Woolen. So I do think it now the pendulum swings back in the other way in favor of Debo Samuel as my favorite wide receiver in this game. On the other side of the ball though, after that confusing approach against the Giants. The Seahawks only had the ball for eight minutes in the first half, which is why everyone looked up and saw only two first half carries for Ken Walker. Nothing unusual there, given that they just didn't have the ball. The Giants literally played keep away and did it well for the entire time. But after the game, McDonald came out and blamed that approach on himself. 
took full credit for it and said, this is a game where we get back to the running the ball, especially after the week prior, remember, Ken Walker in what was deemed as an impossible matchup against Detroit's front seven went out and scored three rushing touchdowns, rushed for 80 yards. So I do think we see McDonald lean back into that approach and getting Ken Walker heavily involved in this game. So if you were concerned about last week's results, do not be. Especially since unlike two years under Shane Waldron, Ken Walker has his highest floor ever and also being involved in the passing game. A 13.9% target share in his three full games this year. So absolutely love Ken Walker in a bounce back spot. Ooh, okay. Good to know. Um, feels like, what was that game a couple weeks? Is the Lions game where he yep. just looked awesome. Destroyed. In, in that game. That was amazing. All right. We got another Sunday morning game. This time it is the Jaguars and the Bears. Kind of feels like both those offenses are coming off their best games, John. And last week was my mistake because we talked about how broken Tre Trevor Lawrence was. And while that's true, historically, he did have success against Gus Bradley's Colts, at least. So maybe we should have leaned into that one a little more. And then we saw him be very successful. Even in the first half, he was 18 of 21. Um, looked incredible until Joe Flacco then rejuvenated the offense in the fourth quarter. We'll talk about Flacco in a bit. But for this one, a lot tougher because... Really, it's hard to slide anything past this Super Bowl caliber Bears defense. And they limited C.J. Stroud to one passing touchdown and that Sunday night game that was a field goal fest that everyone remembers. Matthew Stafford didn't even get there. One pick, zero touchdowns. Last week, stumped Andy Dalton, got him benched in the fourth quarter because by that time, the Bears offense has just run away completely. So really, although... Tank Bigsby exploded. I would say the two running, the two players we're trusting here for the Jaguars, not Trevor Lawrence, more of a super flex only play. To me, I can only get to Brian Thomas Jr., who continues dominating no matter what coverage they throw his way, and Tank Bigsby on the ground. It's going to be interesting because Doug Peterson came out and attributed Travis Etienne's lack of playing time in the second half to a shoulder injury that he just got hurt in pass protection. But the fact is, Tank Bigsby has looked incredible. In the three games they've used him this year, over 70 rushing yards, whereas Etienne only has over 70 rushing yards in one of his last 14 games. I think we see more of a transition or a changing of the guard moving forward where Tank Bigsby is the Jaguars' leading running back, and at least we know the Bears are more susceptible to production on the ground as opposed to the air. On the other side of the ball, it's kind of the same thing. DeAndre Sutas looked amazing the last two weeks, but on Establish the Run, using the promo code FEAST, you'll notice that I have him as a sell high right now because nothing really changed. Handled 73% of the team's running back touches the past two weeks, but he played the Rams and the Panthers. Two defenses who have really struggled to stop the run this year. Not only that, but Roshan Johnson also being used at their goal line back. So for the Bears offense to have success in this game, I think they take the same approach as we talked about last week with Joe Flacco, and we see a big Caleb Williams performance instead via Keenan Allen, DJ Moore especially, and of course Romo Dunze if you need a flex option for deeper leagues. Very interesting about both those. Tanks Bigsby looked awesome. Awesome. I mean, he looked awesome when he was playing against the Colts last week. I don't know if they have Labatt Blue Light over in London. I'm going to guess <laughs> no. But if they do, drink some with friends as you're living life to the power of we over across the pond. If not, get the closest thing to Labatt Blue Light because it's delicious. Always enjoy it responsibly. Beer, Labatt, USA, Buffalo, New York. Okay, it's a juicy one, John. Might be the game of the weekend. It's the Commanders at the Ravens Battle of the Beltway down there in the DMV. The game will be in Baltimore. What are you thinking about this one? These two cities and teams haven't had a matchup this exciting for a while. And it's an intriguing chess match for offensive coordinator Cliff Kingsbury and Jaden Daniels because you can't run on this Ravens team. They have shown they're a pass funnel. Not only has no running back reached 50 yards against them so far, even Josh Allen got stumped for 21 rushing yards. So Baltimore, you have to attack through the air, and they're allowing the fourth most fantasy points per game to opposing quarterbacks that way. I think it's helpful that the last three games, they have not stuck 
to Kingsbury historical offense. They have opened it up more because they've seen what Jaden Daniels can do when you allow him to throw downfield. 14% of his throws, 10th most among all quarterbacks the last three weeks, have come over 20 yards compared to just 5% in the first two games. And since that's how you attack the Ravens, again, it's a chess match. I think it could be a very big week, not only for Daniels through the air, but for Terry McLaurin, who is still the leading target share earner every single week. If you're desperate for a tight end as well, perhaps your tight end is on bye or injured, I do think Zach Ertz, given the success the Ravens have allowed to enemy tight ends, including last week with Mike Jasicki getting there as a top 24 option, I do think Zach Ertz could be a sneaky play this week in what is expected to be a very high-scoring game. On the other side of the ball, it's interesting because... The Ravens did try to run against the Bengals, but Lou Anarumo made it a concerted ap appointment to stop Derrick Henry no matter what. And Derrick Henry had 31 rushing yards going into overtime, only then, because they gave the big dog one more possession, did he explode for that 50-yard run in overtime and then help the Ravens win that game in the very end. But you can run on Washington. You can throw the ball on Washington. So that's why I think the Ravens come out on top here, if only because I don't know what the commanders are going to do to really stop this Ravens offense that no one had been able to stop. Despite the Bengals having success on the ground last week, they still couldn't stop Lamar Jackson through the air as all three tight ends got involved. I'm still concerned about Mark Andrews, who scored the third most points for a tight end on his own team behind Charlie Kolar and Isaiah Likely, but everyone else, Zay Flowers included, uh, I think the Ravens just ultimately get here in the end because beyond Deshaun Watson, the commanders had really struggled to stop any other quarterback this season. Let's move on to a couple of teams that had really impressive wins in California last week. The Arizona Cardinals and the Green Bay Packers in particular, the Cardinals, wow, at the Niners to get that win. And the Packers, without Romeo Dobbs, figured out how to get it done against the Rams. You know, the Romeo Dobbs, that whole situation went down, John, after we recorded last week. Mm -hmm. Just a reminder, it's the show that's so nice we do it twice, two episodes each week, just to kind of break it up for you, make them more digestible um, pieces of content. So... About 25 to 27 minutes each, seven games in episode one, seven games in episode two during these buys. So we got Romeo Dobbs. Will he be the squeaky wheel in this game? Last week you were all over your value pick with Dontavian Wicks, but he's been dropping some passes. He did drop some passes, and there's never been more vitriol online than people who picked up Wicks on waiver wires and then started him screaming at fantasy analysts. Having said that, you should still be encouraged. I know it's hard to look at the results and think it think like that, but you now have, if you picked him up, the Packers wide receiver who led the team in targets in back-to-back -back games. Even last week, the drops, yes, came, but a 28% target share and the team's highest depth of target as a downfield threat. As I mentioned with the Cardinals and leaking big production to Brandon Ayuk along the boundary out wide last week, that's where Dontavian Wicks plays. And he still leads the Packers in red zone targets as well. So I still believe you should be very encouraged on Dontavian Wicks as a top 36 wide receiver this week. I think it's a bounce back spot for him, whether Dobbs plays or not. Because remember, we've only seen so far two starts with Dobbs in the lineup. But the entire thesis of picking up Wicks was because Dobbs has been, for his career, a touchdown or bust option. The wide receiver 48 and wide receiver 54 in his two starts with love this season, whereas Wicks, although sometimes he doesn't catch them, still earns all those targets. So Jaden Reed and Wicks, very safe options despite what happened last week. And then Josh Jacobs, another good spot as well. The Packers can really pick their poison in this game against the Cardinals. We even saw last week Jordan Mason over six yards per carry against Arizona. He just happened to fumble inside the 10-yard line so he doesn't get the 100-yard bonus or a touchdown in that game. But if they want to lean on Josh Jacobs here, of course, he has a top 12 floor and you could absolutely start him and he could go over 100 yards in this matchup. It's also interesting on the other side of the ball though because the Titans backfield was the only one not able to log a top 12 running back against the Packers this year. Think about 
Kyron Williams going for over 100 yards and having a touchdown last week. Aaron Jones got there with 100 yards in, from scrimmage in the box score. Jonathan Taylor, Saquon Barkley before him, all exploded. And so I think this matchup for Drew Petzing and James Conner in particular are what really stand out. James Conner is a top 12 running back, and so one I expect them to lean on to just keep the Packers offense off the field. It's also interesting what's happening at the Cardinals wide receivers because I thought initially Michael Wilson, the team's number two wideout across from Marvin Harrison Jr., had only come on strong and led the team in targets a couple weeks ago because Trey McBride was out. But now if you step back and look at it, over the last three games, Michael Wilson has just two fewer targets than Marvin Harrison Jr. It's actually quite shocking. Hasn't dipped below a 20% target share in any of those three contests. So I think what's happening is that Wilson, not only being a flex option in good matchups like this one, but he's also limiting Marvin Harrison Jr.'s ceiling so far, which is very concerning as we're trying to squeeze him in there as a top 24 wide receiver moving forward. Love it. Absolutely love it. Um, I love the way James Conner runs, by the way. Uh, he kind of Hard. wore down the Niners, it felt like. In the second half, these guys don't really want to tackle him. All right, what about the Texans and the Patriots? We've got a quarterback change in New England. I guess I'm somewhat curious as to whether or not you think that will make any difference whatsoever with any of the Patriots' skill guys. I think it's necessary. I know it's a back-and-forth argument on social media in New England right now as well in newspapers because we don't know if it's too early to throw the rookie in there given the elephant in the room, the New England's offensive line situation. In my opinion, though, they have no choice because Jacoby Brissett, while an athlete, immobile. Whereas Drake May, we know he's at least capable of extending the play, escaping the pocket, and maybe helping alleviate the issues that the offensive line is currently presenting. In two years with North Carolina, Drake may average 9.4 rushing points per game. That's why we're also going to play him in fantasy this week as a super flex starter because he has that high rushing floor that we're always looking for from these quarterbacks outside of the top 12 options because that's what allows them to sneak in as a QB1 weekly. The Texans' front seven is a ferocious one under Miko Ryans, pr creating pressure at the league's fifth highest rate. But again, I think Drake May's mobility at least can help him get there this week. And if he does get there, the one receiver that stands out for 12 and 14 team leagues is Jalen Polk. Polk has not done much as a rookie so far through the first month of the season, but we have seen them open up the offense to him more with him running more routes weekly, including last week when he quietly ran a route on every drop back with Brissett for New England. So if he's the receiver that they're now trusting more and putting out there for literally every snap, that's the player I want to take an ambiguous chance on and hope he's Drake May's favorite wide receiver before we may have to bid a lot of fab on him in free agency in week seven. It's also many changing pieces on the other side of the ball for the Texans because we don't know about Joe Mixon. We don't know about Damian Pierce. Dari Agumba Wale, their pass catching back, got 21 touches over Cam Akers' 11 last week, so he seems to be the preferred option if Mixon is out. But more importantly, the king himself, Nico Collins, is expected to miss multiple games. Last week, Xavier Hutchinson came off the bench and was Nico Collins' direct replacement. What I really think this is a signal is, although it didn't look good last week, still just an 11.5% target share, and Tank Dale has not been over a 20% target share since week one, but I feel as if Bobby Slowick has no choice but to get Dale more involved. Once Nico Collins left the field, Tank Dale still ran the second most routes for Texans, so I'm treating Dale as a buy low player right now, and you can get him for absolute pennies. No one wants him because he hasn't done anything since week one. A couple missed opportunities that CJ Stroud over three and four as well, and I do think Tank Dale is going to be a sneaky wide receiver three this week. Ooh, okay. Um, yeah, the Nico Collins is such a bummer after that deep post. Yep. You know, he was, he's just been so good. That uh, you would think, especially against the Patriots, that they would try to let that thing heal up and get better and feel like they should be able to win the game without him, you would mm -hmm. imagine. What about, speaking of winning a game without him, it looks like that might have to be the case for the New Orleans Saints without Derek Carr. He's got the oblique injury. They host the Bucks on Sunday, and... 
Uh, it sounds like it might be Spencer Rattler time, even though Jake Hayner came in off the bench when Carr got hurt on Monday night. And I thought it was going to be Hayner, but yes, it does sound like they're leaning towards starting fifth rounder Spencer Rattler, who remember, before he transferred to South Carolina and the SEC in his last two seasons, was argued as a potential number one overall pick was in that conversation. And then he had some off-field character concerns, uh, struggled as well. But at South Carolina, still over 3,000 passing yards, again, against SEC competition, uh, in his last two seasons, and 7.1 yards per attempt under pressure, 37th in the nation. So given this matchup against a Buck secondary that has not created pressure because they're dealing with so many injuries and off-season losses and free agency, not only that, but in five games this year, they've allowed four top 12 performances by quarterbacks. I do think Spencer Rattler can be started. I think his surrounding talent with Chris Olave, Rashid Shaheed, Alvin Kamara, in this game against a soft defense, I do think it's actually an exceptional spot if you need a super flex starter. So I have a lot more confidence than a lot of people in Spencer Rattler stepping up, at least this week. Uh, in week seven, he has a short turnaround against the Broncos defense that doesn't allow it to anyone. So at least for one game, I have confidence in Rattler and Rashid Shaheed, who has emerged quietly as the Saints' number one wide receiver. Hasn't dipped below 20% of the team's targets in any game. Everyone still keeps considering him a fancy, deep player, but he runs slants, he moves the chains, he does everything you ask of him. So, love Shahid and Kamara, despite the injury at quarterback as well. On the other side of the ball, we've seen Baker Mayfield continue to be exceptional outside of his one performance against the Broncos defense, which again, stumps everybody. And in this one in particular, where the Saints have leaked the most production is in the slot. We're going to probably get uh, our favorite Mike Evans, Marshawn Lattimore matchup from the outside and let them battle it out. And so Chris Godwin from the slot, including last week where Judas Smith-Schuster on Monday night had two catches for 63 yards, that seems to be the elite play here. Godwin even in two matchups against the Saints last year, eight catches for 114 yards and three for 83 and one touchdown. Don't miss the new Hulu original drama La Maquina starring Diego Luna, Gael Garcia Bernal, and Asa Gonzalez. La Maquina is the first Spanish-language original series from Hulu. In their long-awaited on-screen reunion, Gael and Diego play lifelong friends, one a boxer and the other his crafty manager, making one last attempt at glory in the ring. But to make it to fight night, they must confront a mysterious underworld organization raising the stakes to life or death. All episodes of La Maquina are streaming now on Hulu. I love tailgating, I love contests, and I love Smirnoff because they're giving fans in select areas of the country a chance to win the ultimate game day experience. From tickets to sideline passes and much more. Just head to wedogamedays.com until November 15th to enter for your chance to win. Smirnoff, we do game days. Please drink responsibly. Smirnoff number 21 vodka distilled from grain, 40% alcohol by volume. The Smirnoff Company, New York, New York. Please not share with anyone under legal drinking age. No purchase necessary. 21 plus ends 11, 15, 24. See rules at website for participating area and other important details. Sponsored by Diageo Americas Incorporated, New York, New York. Last but not least, we've got the Browns and the Eagles. Eagles coming off the bye. I think the expectation as we record this Wednesday is that Devontae Smith, A.J. Brown, and Lane Johnson will be back in the lineup. As for the Browns, it's just kind of getting uglier and uglier, John. It is getting uglier, and that's why I believe the Eagles' role in this game. It's been three weeks, I guess nearly a month now after the bye, since we've seen the Eagles at full strength in Week 1 in Brazil against the Packers. But in that game, they were one of the fastest-paced offenses, top six. They were third in no huddle rate. A.J. Brown led the team with a 34.5% target share for over 100 yards and a touchdown. Devonta Smith, because A.J. Brown was available and getting to play from out wide, got to be in that power slot role under Kellen Moore. 
as Keenan Allen and CeeDee Lamb have been historically the past few seasons under Moore, and he chipped in with a 27.5% target share for seven catches as well. Saquon Barkley also was a power running back in that game. So honestly, just how much the Browns' defense is also leaking explosive plays, it seems like a game where the Eagles should have no issues scoring here. A.J. Brown's my favorite of the bunch. Uh, again, we haven't seen him in a full month, but especially given the rate at which the Browns play man coverage, I don't need to tell you numbers to know that if you put A.J. Brown in man coverage, he's probably going to dominate you 10 out of 10 times. So Brown is my favorite on-paper matchup for this one, but the Eagles offense, just something to be incredibly high on here. And on the other side of the ball, it, it's not as easy, admittedly, because that's supposed to be a layup matchup against the Commanders for Deshaun Watson. We mentioned, even for Lamar Jackson, how everyone in their first three games, at least, against the Commanders was a top-seven quarterback for fantasy. And then, of course, they play Watson, and he can't even crack the top 18, uh, despite throwing for one touchdown. So Amari Cooper right now, after David Njoku suffered yet another injury, a knee injury at the end of that game, we don't know if he'll be available for this one, but Amari Cooper, because of the targets at least, the only player we can trust for Cleveland's offense right now. I trust you, John. That's why you're the co-host of the Fantasy Feast podcast. Still got seven more games to get to on episode two. Check him out at NotJDaigle, EstablishTheRun.com, code FEAST. I am at Ross Tucker NFL. We are at Ross Tucker Pod, and we're ready for dessert. Thanks for tuning in to Fantasy Feast. Make sure to also check out the Ross Tucker Football Podcast, Even Money, and College Draft, all on the DraftKings Network, YouTube, or subscribe to the podcast on your favorite platform. (laughs) 